Hi. I think you could do better than that. Hello. Hi. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Linda Frost. I'm Dean of the UTC Honors College. And it's my very great pleasure to thank you all for coming today and to welcome you. I want to first recognize a few folks who helped to put this together today. Megan Phillips uh, for the beautiful poster. It is a really lovely piece of art. Uh, Rebecca Caldwell, who is probably out there dealing with um, boxes for handling lots of setup details, including lunch with our student, staff, our student staffers. And those are student assistant directors, Ellie Minecci and Adriel Poramas. Ryan Berry gets a special shout out for setting up chairs for us at an ungodly hour. I'm so grateful to him. Mike Andrews and all of his crew, thank you so much for coming and taping the talk. Doctors Coons, Jordan, Quinlan, O'Day, and Kimbrough. And can all of you sort of wave your hands? Because these guys are the reason for the season, right? Uh, they are our faculty here in Honors Humanities, which for the alumni, and I'm going to recognize you in a heartbeat, um, you know this class. It's the same class, really. It's different, but it it's, does a lot of the same things that it should, and we're thrilled to be able to continue to offer that um, as part of Honors. It gets harder and harder every year, but we keep doing it because we're obnoxious like that. Anyway, um, those, those five folks, we now have five sections of humanities to serve our 80 incoming Brock Scholars, and those five folks chose our speaker today. The O'Day Lecture Series is an annual event, and it's intended to acknowledge the tremendous work done, I always get verklempt when I say this, done by Greg O'Day in Honors Education at UTC. And he's right there. That's Greg O'Day, and we love him. That was perfect, thank you. Few of us care about the possibilities and the tragic possible dismissal of the humanities as a viable, vital intellectual practice as much as Greg. So it is a fitting tribute in my eyes. The O'Day Lecture focuses on the humanities to ensure that we keep these concerns at the center of our university conversations. According to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the humanities are disciplines of memory and imagination, telling us where we have been and helping us envision where we are going. The humanities generally include the study of languages, literature, history, jurisprudence, philosophy, comparative religion, ethics, and the arts. Um, I should recognize my staff, because they're here. Did, did Charisse, is Charisse still here? Charisse is dealing with our selection thing. So can my staff stand up? Um, Charisse Williams, our Director of Operations and Admissions. <laughs> You're chewing, Will Kuby, who's chewing, is uh, the Associate Dean, the new Greg O'Day. Uh, Dr. Trey Strasberger is our new Director of Nationally Competitive Scholarship. Rebecca is outside, Jada has already been recognized, and I have not, and Drew Bailey is our current faculty lead for Innovations and Honors. We just hired for this position, very excited. Dr. Jordan King is gonna be joining us um, in, the, in this summer, so pretty excited about that. Anyway, my staff, but our fabulous UTC Honors College Advisory Board, some of whom are here today, and y'all need to stand up. Sucks for you. <laughs> Yay. These are real live alumni. They're going to be talking to y'all later from 3 to 5 when you all come through and get more food from us. It'll be dessert then, so just be sure to come through then. Um, but it was our advisory board who, and headed up by Dr. Kelly Jo um, Fulkerson Takua, who could not be here today, who I love with all of my heart. They opted to make this series the object of our fundraising for our 2023 Honors Alumni Gala. It's a big party we do every fall. Liz Mayonis, right there, you recognized her once, wave at us, Liz, basically made that event a reality. And as a result, we raised over $36,000 in a matter of what felt like 20 minutes of paddle raising. That is something. I'm sorry, that is something. Those funds have allowed us to endow this series, although we could use your dollars to increase that endowment and expand our ability to broadcast the good news about the critical role of the humanities in our society. And one more person to note before I turn the mic over to Dr. Devery Kimbrough to introduce this year's speaker. Our, I don't know if she's here, is Mandy here? Mandy Lamb? Is Mandy here? Ah, so Mandy Lamb, she's not here, so we'll just wave at her. She won the award of being the most generous donor of the evening, and she got a special edition Grego Day bobblehead. I know you all want one of those. Anyway, 
Um, keep on your calendars. Our 2024 gala will be on Saturday, September 28th, and it will, we will raise so much more money that night. To Dr. Kimbrough. All right, I'm here to introduce someone I've known of for quite some time, and I was happy to spend some time with her last evening. Uh, Catherine Gillen is professor of English at Texas A&M University, San Antonio. She is the author of Chaste Value, Economic Crisis, Female Chastity, and the Production of Social Difference on Shakespeare's Stage, Edinburgh University Press. Is that correct? OK. <laughs> I saw EUP. I had to try to remember my, my, my uh, academic lineage and several essays on race, gender, and economics in early modern drama and Shakespeare appropriation. She is working on a monograph tentatively titled Shakespeare's Racial Classicism, Whiteness, Slavery, and Humanism, which examines Shakespeare's use of classical sources within the context of emer emerging racial capitalism. With Catherine Romero Santos and Adriana M. Santos, she co-founded the Borderlands Shakespeare Collectiva, which has been receiving funding from the Mellon Foundation, Foundation and the NEH. The Borderlands Shakespeare Collectiva, or BCS, BSC, excuse me, is a group of scholars, educators, artists, and activists who engage with Shakespeare in ways that reflect the lived realities of the US-Mexico borderlands. Using decolonial and community accountable approaches, we amplify the world-making power of the region's languages, traditions, and ways of knowing. We aim not only to change the way Shakespeare is taught and performed, but also to promote the socially just features, uh, futures envisioned in El Arte de la Frontera. So I will turn the time over to Dr. Gillen. Thank you all so much for being here today. Let me make sure the mic is picking me up since I'm tall. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you especially to Dr. Kimbrough, to Dean Frost, and to Rebecca Caldwell for all of their work to bring me here today. It is such an honor to be here as part of the O'Day lecture series, and it was an honor to meet Professor O'Day earlier um, this afternoon as well. So I'm really thrilled with all the wonderful work you're doing here, and I've been so glad to learn more about it. So. I want to talk today a bit more about the process of um, building the Borderland Shakespeare Collectiva and also to think about, to let you know a little bit about the work that artists in the US-Mexico borderlands are doing to adapt and appropriate Shakespeare, um, and also to think about the kind of community-engaged humanities that can like support that work and to bring that into our own scholarship and teaching and learning. So I'm going to start, see if this works, okay, to begin with. So a couple of um, thoughts about terminology. La Frontera is a term that really means um, the borderlands, right? So the, the US-Mexico borderlands. So I want to talk about that for a minute. So undergoing Spanish colonization and then forcibly incorporated into the United States in 1848 following the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the US-Mexico borderlands have been shaped by colonial and anti-colonial struggles. As Gloria E. Ansaldúa, who's a very famous theorist of the borderlands, writes, quote, this land has survived possession and ill use by five countries, Spain, Mexico, the Republic of Texas, the US, the Confederacy, and then the US again. These waves of colonization in La Frontera a space encompassing, as you can see there, northern Mexico and parts of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, were driven by the white settler colonial desire to appropriate indigenous land, labor, and resources, and by concomitant efforts to maintain the power to enslave diasporic Africans living in the Americas. The effects of this colonial history continue to reverberate in the borderlands evident in the deaths, detention, and family separation of migrants at the border, and in racial inequality, labor exploitation, and environmental destruction. Colonial power continues to meet resistance in the region, however, as activists work to protect human rights and to fight for the sovereignty of, na of native nations 
and for the self-determination of communities populated primarily by black, Latinx, and indigenous residents. Border art and culture contributes to these collective projects by disrupting colonial logics and sustaining the region's communities, often performing restorative healing work. This decolonial, art, decolonial artistic project includes what my collaborators Adriana M. Santos and Catherine Romero Santos call Borderland Shakespeare. And there's a little information about Borderland Shakespeare up there. And these are a growing body of multilingual translations, adaptations, and appropriations that situate Shakespeare within the complex cultures and languages of La Frontera. Written primarily by Chicanx and indigenous playwrights, and when I say Chicanx, I mean Mexican-American, but also a sort of politicized um, identity that really means, um, that calls attention to the indigenous roots of Chicanx people in, in the Americas, um, and the sense that, right, the border crossed them, they didn't cross the border in many cases. Some people are obviously more recent, recent immigrants, but um, sort of a, a political identity that's committed to um, civil, right, civil rights um, in the region as well. So these plays, these adaptations, engage with Shakespeare's treatment of many issues, family, migration, sexuality, power, all the things that we know Shakespeare talks about, right? But they do that and in ways that reflect local concerns. And rather than ceding cultural, cultural, linguistic, artistic, or epistemological authority to Shakespeare, they interpolate Shakespeare into a rich web of indigenous Chicanx and Latinx stories, rituals, mythologies, and languages. And so you, as you can see here, this tradition acknowledges that Shakespeare can be a representative of kind of white Anglo-colonial power, but it wants a kind of rest control of that power, um, you know, back in the service of local communities. Um, in particular, Borderland Shakespeare is influenced by the tradition of El Teatro Campesino. Um, founded by Luis Valdez in 1965 on the picket lines of the Delano um, grape strike um, in Delano, California, this theatrical wing of the United Farm Workers made particular use of actos, short scenes performed on flatbed trucks and in union halls. The actos were often performed by farm workers and they caricatured foremen, landowners, and corrupt politicians in an effort to bring attention to injustices in the fields and to encourage farm workers to join the movement. As David Roman argues, El Teatro Campesino became central to the political work of the movement for Chicano civil rights, often called the Movimiento, as Chicanexes, quote, reformulated their sense of identity from one of oppression and victimization to one of resistance and survival. As other teatros have developed in the spirit of El Teatro Campesino, Borderland Shakespeare appropriations have become part of this radical activist tradition. Embracing the Chicanx spirit of rasquachismo, or making do, they take what they need from Shakespeare, integrating his work with countless other influences. And so today, I would like to continue to talk about this kind of cultural, um, you know, literary, um, political work of Borderland Shakespeare to give you some examples of what it is. And I also would like to talk about the work that my collaborators and I have done to make this work more broadly accessible, largely to the communities from which it arose, um, including our students. I teach at Texas A&M San Antonio, um, and so many of our, my students have really influenced my desire to learn more about this work and to also make it more um, accessible. So I want to talk more about that project and how we're supporting that kind of culturally sustaining pedagogy and programming um, in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Let's see. Um, so the U.S.-Mexico borderlands may initially seem like an unlikely place to find Shakespeare. However, as in many places around the world, Shakespeare's works have been employed as tools of colonial power in the region, used in schools and theaters to buttress the supremacy of white Anglo language and power. In the borderlands, Shakespeare remains associated not only with the English literary canon, but also with the U.S. settler state. His works and image seem ever present, but also in some ways alien and alienating. As Ruben Espinosa argues, quote, 
Because of Shakespeare's deep interconnection with English and with Englishness, he is often perceived to be less accessible to certain users, such as Latinxes. While apprehension surrounding the naughty nature of Shakespearean verse might guide these perceptions, attitudes about Shakespeare's place in the establishment of English linguistic and cultural identity certainly drive these views. <coughs> Given Shakespeare's prominence, Borderlands residents have no choice but to interact with his plays, which, as y'all know, are always you know, taught in high schools and are very common in um, theaters as well. But Shakespeare proves to be a site of contestation, functioning as a representative of an Anglo-European and or white hegemony, but also as a familiar and malleable set of texts, ideas, and characteristics that can be incorporated into the region's mestizaje, a term that Rafael Perez Torres defines as an affirmative recognition of the mixed racial, social, linguistic, cultural, national, and ethnic legacies inherent in Latinx communities. As scholars of post-colonial Shakespeare has demonstrated, Shakespeare remains imbricated within colonial histories, even as his provocative engagements with questions of power, identity, and language offer generative material through which to interrogate colonial dynamics. Let's see. As Espinosa contends, one can scrutinize Shakespeare as being a tool of colonial oppression while simultaneously recognizing that the colonial, post-colonial, or neo-colonial subject can appropriate that tool for their own anti-colonial ends. And you can see here several works that do write back to Shakespeare, that appropriate Shakespeare for their own ends. So you have M. Césaire's Un Tempet, which is an appropriation of the Tempest um, from Martinique. You have Toni Morrison's Desdemona, which really rewrites Othello from a black feminist perspective. And then you have um, a, a film, like Ankara, by um, Michel Bardouage, who has done a, a trilogy of Shakespeare plays that are set in uh, the film, film adaptations that are in India. Um, and they really don't so much write back to Shakespeare as really decenter the English context of the plays in order to highlight local, local concerns. So um, these kinds of productions really attempt to repossess Shakespeare um, for communities that were not necessarily intended as the primary audience. So while reproducing Shakespeare runs the risk of reaffirming his centrality, colonized subjects continue to do so, both because his plays at times invite anti-colonial readings and also because they offer, offer opportunities to negotiate, possess, or transform the white Western canon, and by extension, the forms of power that it represents. So playwrights in the borderlands participate in this phenomenon of global Shakespeare appropriation, but their approach is influenced by their specific geographical and cultural position in a region shaped not only by kind of English and US colonialism, but Spanish colonialism um, in particular. So in the borderlands, Shakespeare's resonance is thus shaped not only by the kind of general ubiquity of Shakespeare in schools and theaters, but also by Shakespeare's contemporaneity with Spanish colonialism in the region, um, and by Shakespeare's function in kind of US settler colonial projects. As for example, in 1848, which is just two years before the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which annexes all that land, you know, Texas and everything, there was a production in Corpus Christi by the US military of Othello, in which Ulysses S. Grant was initially cast as Desdemona. How wild, just stop and like, think about that for a while. But he didn't actually end up going on stage. I guess there was a little bit of like a homophobic panic about Ulysses, the great general. You know, I don't know if he was quite the great general yet. But anyway, he was still a big deal. Um, so anyway, the point is, they're playing this, you know, kind of racist play in Corpus Christi while they're trying to like invade Mexico. And so there's this like long history of like what Shakespeare is doing um, in the region. And so by reimagining Shakespeare's plays in varied contexts and temporalities, Borderlands playwrights critique this colonial legacy of the early modern period and they tell stories from Borderlands perspectives that disrupt often whitewashed narratives. So as we note um, in the introduction to our anthology, which I'll talk a bit more about soon, Borderland Shakespeare appropriations emphasize the value, beauty, and restorative power of indigenous and Chicanx languages, genres, mythologies, and rituals, providing a counterpoint to the Western epistemologies or sort of ways of knowing worldviews that are conveyed in their source texts. 
I know some of y'all have read The Language of Flowers, is that right, by Aditya Real? Awesome, I'm really excited to hear what some of you think about it. Um, there are two other Romeo and Juliet adaptations in volume one of The Bard in the Borderlands, and one of them is James Lujan's um, Kino and Teresa. So I wanna talk about that um, for a minute. So in this play, Taos Pueblo playwright James Lujan asks readers and audiences to consider events contemporaneous with the publication and performance of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet by transporting the play to Santa Fe, a colonial province established by Juan de Oñate in 1598, just one year after Romeo and Juliet first appeared in print. And so I think sometimes we can think of these like English histories and American histories as somehow like temporally distinct, but these events are kind of happening at the same time. So, um, Set in the aftermath of the 1680 Pueblo Revolt and the 1692 Spanish Reconquista, the feud that animates the action of Kino and Teresa is no longer an unexplained ancient grudge, as you see in Romeo and Juliet, um, but instead a conflict that is clearly created by Spanish exploitation and this place centers indigenous resistance. Other Borderlands Shakespeare plays engage with later histories of oppression and resistance. The Chicano labor and civil rights movement of the 1960s and 70s figures prominently in this body of work. Set in the agricultural fields of the, of the Rio Grande Valley, Ceres Jaime Magana's The Tragic Corrido of Romeo and Lupe reflects the continued legacies of the movimiento. In his appropriation of Romeo and Juliet, the lovers meet not at a party, but at a protest against unjust labor practices and environmental devastation caused by kind of agribusiness. Uh, many Borderland Shakespeare's plays, plays, however, critique the imperialist policies that have criminalized immigration while also creating the conditions in Mexico and Central America that have forced people to seek asylum and work in the United States. Um, so Edith Villarreal's The Language of Flowers is one of those plays, as is Herbert Siguenza's El Henry, which is a kind of post-apocalyptic Henry IV Part I, and then Monica Andrade's and Stephen Richter's Marquez and Narco Macbeth, which is a narco um, sort of Macbeth, but both of them are really calling attention to the US, role of US intervention in Mexico and Latin America, um, and the way that that intervention has given rise to illicit economies, such as the drug trade, but also um, you know, sort of forced and then criminalized immigration. Because of its complex negotiation of coloniality, Borderland Shakespeare, like other decolonial appropriations, offers generative approaches from which we might learn as we seek to make the humanities less colonial. Um, and two uh, theorists and, and colleagues of ours I really look to to think about this are, are Catherine Merla Watson and Ben V. Ben v. Olguin. And they write that the Latinx speculative arts remind us that we cannot imagine our collective futures without recognizing with the hoary ghosts of colonialism and modernity that continue to exert force through globalization and neoliberal capitalism. And it's sort of a central contention of the collectiva that Shakespeare is one such ghost <laughs> that we must deal with. Um, and borderland Shakespeare playwrights do reckon with this ghost, disrupting colonial narratives and canons to create what Emma Perez calls a decolonial imaginary in which liberatory futures can be imagined and articulated. So I'd like to turn now to the work of actually building the collectiva and what it means to be doing community-engaged humanities and especially um, humanities that's not white-centric. And I'll say also for full disclosure, I, I'm white, so I'm not saying anything, anything against white people, just that white people, the humanities has historically centered whiteness and a white kind of uh, tradition. And so to think about like, what do we need to unpack to create a humanities that's much more sort of open and accessible and allow space for different traditions and different knowledges. So um, as uh, Professor Kimbo um, mentioned in her introduction, the Borderline Shakespeare, Shakespeare Collectiva is an organization that seeks to archive, curate, and circulate Borderland Shakespeare adaptations and to generate resources for teachers and theater practitioners and you know, the general public about the role of Shakespeare in the context of the US-Mexico borderlands. 
So we're a coalition of teachers, scholars, activists, theater makers, who are really seeking to transform the way Shakespeare is taught and performed to reflect, at least in the region, to, but, but outside it as well, to reflect the lived realities of La Frontera and to sustain its diverse cultures. As we have endeavored to create an anti-colonial and anti-racist Shakespeare project, my collaborators and I have learned a great deal from Mexican American studies and indigenous studies. And my colleague, Adriana Santos, is actually in Chicanx studies. So we're sort of thinking about this as an interdisciplinary collaboration. As I mentioned before, most Shakespeare projects center white audiences, um, like many public humanities projects do. And as Ayanna Thompson demonstrates in her really amazing collection there, Passing Strange, um, these programs often walk the tightrope between espousing the value of Shakespeare through the rhetoric of liberal humanism and espousing the value of Shakespeare through the rhetoric of neocolonialism. And as my colleague um, Catherine Romero Santos writes in an article about the Folger Shakespeare Library's 2016 folio tour, where the folio was brought around to, you know, Shakespeare's like the big book that like has all the Shakespeare, was like brought around to different places so that people could learn about it. Um, but it was also very much like come and revere the book a, a little bit, had that, had that edge to it. So Katie is writing about this and saying that sometimes public humanities projects like that take an overly artifact-driven approach to the humanities, as well as this kind of universalizing approach that suggests that this somehow this book means the same thing to everybody. Um, and she's saying that this kind of render, renders issues of race or culture kind of marginal. So problematic in any context, such an approach would afflict acute colonial violence in the borderlands and in, the, in relation to borderland Shakespeare, since these works are really speaking specifically to indigenous and Chicanx audiences. So as Santos writes, um, works of borderland Shakespeare bring into sharp relief the urgency and value of creating public humanities programming that is informed and shaped by the methodologies of pre-modern critical race scholarship. The Borderlands Shakespeare Collectiva and the Bard in the Borderlands are in many ways a response to this need for more diverse, anti-racist, and decolonial programming. Our projects also reflect a desire to circulate and archive the brilliant responses to Shakespeare being created by Borderlands artists, and we take our lead from their attentiveness to questions of language, power, race, labor, and access. Doing so has meant resisting the white colonial tendencies of the public humanities in which projects are often envisioned as either sort of targeting elite audiences or as targeting marginalized audiences, but who are imagined as needing somehow like uplift or humanization by you know, encounter with Shakespeare. So we have opted instead for the framework of the community engaged humanities, which draws from critical ethnic studies fields. So community engaged humanities is really not just scholars taking what they know and like telling the public about it. It's really a much more sustained engagement with the actual communities in which we live and work. So it involves really the co-production of knowledge between scholars and community members, that knowledge actually comes from the community. It doesn't just come from the scholar. Often the scholars also from the community themselves. It involves time to develop relationships with people out um, you know, in the community. It's also like you know, throughout different stages, and it's often interdisciplinary, and it has specific goals that are about the public. So in our instance, we're invested in, say, helping high school teachers actually teach these plays in ways that support their students, like their actual goals, not just the abstract production of, of knowledge. And so we further follow the guidance of our colleague, Elena Fowlis, who is thinking about um, oral history projects and public humanities projects in Latinx in Latinx communities in particular. And what Elena, which is my colleague, so I'm calling her Elena, Dr. Fowles, what she argues is um, that you need to be especially um, attentive to issues of language when you're working with Latinx communities and to sort of have people with bilingual facility. You also have to be aware of the histories of linguistic terrorism that have sort of told people that in some cases they can't speak their language or they're punished in schools for doing so. Um, and also she advocates that we work toward um, what she calls comunidad or community, which is a culturally sort of entrenched, yeah, cultural value of friendship and mutual respect 
that the, the scholars should try to emulate and engage in. So that if you're not sort of being welcomed into this community, then you're not kind of like you shouldn't be there, right? Um, and also that you need to be really clear about the ways in which Latinx and other marginalized communities, right? People have often just been written about in scholarship, but to actually like flip that so you're saying, no, 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 these people are like creating the scholarship and they're creating it um, with me. And doing this kind of work also resonates with um, the theorist uh, Alexi Alexis Pauline Gums understanding of community accountable scholarship. And what she means by that is scholarship that's not just done with community, but is like accountable to those communities and accountable to sort of open to feedback, critique from the communities and actually benefits and serves um, those communities. So my collaborators and I have tried to follow these principles as we have explored the intersections of Shakespeare and Borderlands culture and amplify the work of Borderlands artists. And to and do this, we are trying to say that across our editing, our teaching, our writing, our programming, that we are maintaining kind of reciprocal, open relationships with a whole range of stakeholders and people that we work with. And so one of the ways um, we're doing this is through our open access um, anthology. We're really excited that our, our anthology has been published by um, ACMRS Press and they're committed to an open access model. So the book, you can actually find it if you just, I think, Google, Google it and it'll come up. It's under pre press books. And so it's open, it is open access. You can buy print versions, but we were really committed to the open access idea. Um, because we wanted to make sure that even people who didn't have like a lot of money or access to like, libraries and schools were, you know, were able to, to read um, the book. Um, the first volume contains mostly Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet adaptations. And the second volume, which is coming out very soon, we're hoping um, in the next month or two, contains a wider range of adaptations. So we have a Winter's Tale adaptation by the playwright Jose Cruz Gonzalez, who's really a well-known, amazing playwright. Uh, Measure for Measure, A Merchant of Venice, and A Comedy of Errors, um, La Comedia of Errors. It's a really great play um, adaptation as well. And then volume three includes some of the um, you know, the Narco Macbeth and the post-apocalyptic Henry IV, as well as the queer Chicano Hamlet. Um, we were also really thrilled. Part of our mission is to support community arts. And um, we worked with Celeste de Luna, who is a, mostly a print maker. She lives in San Antonio. She's from the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and she actually, we commissioned this, this, this uh, print that is now the cover. Um, and so she really drew a lot of her imagery from a play called The Tragic Corrido of Romeo and Lupe. Um, and she has, so you see the, the moon goddess, um, Choyopakwi, right at the top, the Virgin of Guadalupe. And you have a little skull, which is a sort of allusion to Hamlet holding the skull. But Shakespeare and Hamlet are sort of decentered there in the service of Borderlands imagery. Um, the image itself is the Mano Poderosa, which is a Catholic image, and you usually see little saints like above the fingers. Um, and sometimes the hand sort of has a stigmata sort of vibe, but here it has the river of the Rio Grande, as well as the barbed wire, which is sort of suggesting um, some of the violence of the artificial border, especially on the nat natural landscape. So it's a little hard to see it here, but you have the Nepales, the cactus, you have the poinsettias or noche buenas, um, little cotton balls, there's a green jay. So um, we really enjoyed working with her um, to think about the connection between art and theater here as well. So let's see. Um, yes, so we really saw that when we started uh, this project, we were really working with unpublished scripts. And students and teachers kept asking us, like, how do we get that? My students would like to engage with that, those plays. Um, and we didn't have a good answer. We would just ask them, like, hey, well, you can email them or whatever. Maybe they'll share it. So we were really excited um, that the anthology could make the plays accessible, but also um, provide a critical apparatus so that people, especially not from the area, could understand them better. Um, but also the people in the area could see their cultures reflected and as part of a long uh, tradition, right? Because these plays are really rooted in Borderlands theater. And we did um, 
decide, we don't translate. Some of the plays are bilingual. We decided not to translate because we wanted to kind of keep the sort of authenticity of the bilingual code switching, um, you know, language that is in the plays themselves. And we don't like italicize Spanish, like in the Borderlands context, it's really not a foreign language. It's a language that many people speak. We do provide a glossary though, and we have, you know, have some notes and introductions that aid um, with understanding as well. So I wanted to transition um, for a minute to talk about teaching Shakespeare in a sort of politically teaching and learning, right? Studying Shakespeare in this kind of difficult political climate that I know many of us find ourselves in, in Texas where I am or in Tennessee where we all are now. Um, and I wanted to call attention to the work of um, Tony Diaz and the Libro Traficantes. Um, so they're trafficking books, that's the idea of the Libro Traficantes. And our um, introduction, when we were writing our introduction, it was on the 10 year anniversary of this march, that, that is Tony Diaz in the middle right there, that um, this group of Libro Traficantes did because they were protesting um, Arizona State Bill 2281, which was banning ethnic studies um, and responding to the success of the Tucson School District's um, ethnic studies program. So they said all these works of Mexican American studies were illegal. And they also um, banned the Tempest as they did this. So um, because temp the Tempest, because it has all these themes of colonialism, were being, was, and enslavement was being taught in the um, program, so they made it illegal to teach the Tempest. A lot of people freaked out. They were like, what, you're banning Shakespeare? <laughs> Which maybe detracted some of the attention from the point that they were actually banning Mexican-American literature. But still, it got a lot of attention. And so Tony um, Diaz, who's this wonderful kind of activist and scholar and critic in Houston, um, led this march to Arizona, basically. And he says, at, at the time, he said, it's clear to me that our intellectual advancement is a threat to some people because they try to make it illegal. Um, and such efforts, right, deny students opportunities to learn about their cultures and identities. Um, and this is not new, right? It's part of a long history, and it's also not a thing of the past, as we see since it's something that's happening um, to us right now. And so I know that's something we're all sort of facing. So I wanted to talk a bit more, right, about how the anthology responds to that and how we've seen um, Borderland Shakespeare plays as a means, of, to use the language of the Libro Traficantes, as a means of smuggling Shakespeare into increasingly surveilled educational spaces. And so we see the anthology as part of that legacy. And we hope, especially if, I know some of y'all are probably future teachers, if it's hard to teach Mexican-American lit or African-American lit or indigenous lit, sometimes the Shakespeare appropriations right, can like, be a way in. Um, so let's see, yes. So we have found, my collaborators and I have found that Shakespeare plays really resonate with students, these Borderlands plays, and that they've helped our efforts to engage with culturally sustaining pedagogy, which is described by educational theorist Django Paris as an approach that honors students' languages, traditions, and experiences as vital funds of knowledge. As Borderlands playwrights reimagine Shakespeare to reflect their identities and concerns, these plays give students the tools to interrogate Shakespeare's cultural place, to interpret his works in conversation with their own lived experiences, and to create their own artistic responses to canonical works of literature. Teaching Borderlands Shakespeare plays thus open space for thinking critically with students about how we can best serve our communities when we teach, produce, or adapt Shakespeare, and how we can do so in ways that avoid replicating colonialist and white supremacist ideologies. So, let's see. Another play, one of the other Romeo and Juliet adaptations that I really love is called The Tragic Corrido of Romeo and Lupe. And this play is um, by Ceres Jaime Magana, set in the valley. And in this play, Romeo's mixed race family runs the Campbell Irrigation um, 
uh, company, right? And um, it's trying to buy up land for its irrigation pipes. And Lupe's family very much resists that. They're sort of leading protests. There's an amazing protest scene that disrupts the celebration that's like celebrating the bounty of the valley, etc. And the play is largely in, it's very much bilingual, right? And so it also, it's called the tragic corrido of Romeo and, Lu and um, Julia, I'm oh, sorry, and of Romeo and Lupe. And a corrido is a Mexican ballad form, right? And it comes, I mean, there are different origin stories. One way of thinking about it is it's a ballad, a European ballad, right, that comes from Spain. And then it's also incorporated with indigenous and African influences in um, Mexico. And it becomes also a genre of the border. And the corrido often tells stories of border crossers and lovers and all kinds of kind of tragic, dramatic events, right? So my students have really responded well to thinking about the specificity of the tragic corrido in the valley, which is a place many of them are familiar with, um, as well as the use of this Mexican form. And, and you can, I don't know, has anybody heard corridos? No, it's not really a Tennessee form, but it's related to the sort of ballads that, you know, that are, do have a kind of more Eastern Appalachian tradition as well. I think Bad Bunny did a corrido recently. Um, they're, they're becoming more popular. Um, in any case, so one thing, um, that Magana does is open Romeo and Juliet with a corrido. So, we, so two things, right? It's the form that he imagines the whole play in, right? The whole thing is the tragic ballad, right, of the lovers. Um, but he also opens it. So, y'all have have you, anybody has anybody read Romeo and Juliet recently? The whole like two households, both alike in dignity. There's that prologue, right? The chorus at the beginning of Romeo and Juliet. Um, so he has this um, song, which I'm not going to sing, right? But it gives us this important advice, right? No le digas no al amor, no hagas, hagas tanto coraje. Este es mi mensaje, don't say no to love, right? So my message is don't say no to love. Don't be so brave as to say no to love. And then uh, Magana goes on, right, to talk about what it means to actually um, have this story set in these fertile lands of the Magic Valley, which become the space of love and strife. So does anybody, since I feel like I know I've been talking for a while, <laughs> does anyone have any observations? I know y'all are, many of you are brilliant honor students at the moment, and I know we have alumni and faculty as well, but does anybody have any thoughts about what it means to, or why it might be interesting to begin the play with a corrido rather than like a chorus. It's still kind of choric, but anybody have any thoughts? I know it's a big room. Yeah. Um, I guess it kind of makes it relatable to the target audience. Like if you grew up around that kind of culture and this is something that's not even super, super unheard of, then seeing this in basically a foreign work would be really relatable. Yeah, you're right. I think it really makes the audience feel like at home. And this play makes a point of being very rooted. Like at one point, the Romeo figure is walking by and he's like, has anyone seen Lupe? And, and the singer pops out and like, oh, she lives right over there in the corner of like Polk and whatever other street, but it was actual street in the town near the theater, you know? So it really is trying to do that. Like this is a play for this audience, definitely. Um, so we talk about this, we talk about how it's bilingual, how it's not really, it's sort of translated, but not really translated. We also talk about Magana's use of both Christian and indigenous mythology. Um, Lupe is named after La Virgen de Guadalupe, who is a famous symbol of kind of European, Christian, and indigenous religious beliefs that is very, very important in Mexico. Uh, it's kind of a virgin, it's a, it's a Virgin Mary uh, figure, but a Mexican iteration. Um, we also pay attention to Magana's engagement with Mexica mythology, which is uh, the word that the people we know more commonly as Aztecs would have used to describe themselves. Um, this is particularly true um, 
he, he talks for a minute about Itachi Watto and Popo, Popo Katapet, who were um, lovers, indigenous lovers, who were kept apart because their tribes were at war with each other. And they're also the names of these famous volcanoes in Mexico. And it's an interesting story because the story predates Romeo and Juliet, but they're called Itza and Popo for short. Itza and Popo are often called the Mexican Romeo and Juliet, which is sort of interesting even though Romeo and Juliet comes later, it's a later story. But Magana's play by like inserting that reference kind of like, I don't know, sort of disrupts this timeline. He's very interested in colonial timelines and what it might mean to like disrupt them or reconfigure them. And I think there's something going on there, thinking about this European tradition in relation to this um, more indigenous Mexican tradition. And I think we have time. I wanted to show you all quickly um, a production that my students created because I think one of the great beauties of these Borderlands adaptations is that they open up space for students and other creative people to create their own adaptations that reflect their own concerns in local context, right? Which might not be Borderlands context, right? There might be other, other contexts. So I wanted to show you all um, this video, and then I have a couple more things to say, and then we'll move on to the question and answer period, because I know you all have, have a lot to say. Um, OK, let's see if I can do this. Well, that's good to know. I'm pretty sure even you're going to say 
for a minute. Um, wonderful. Thank you all. Um, my students will be very um, proud that y'all um, were able to see their work. Um, as you could see in this appropriation of Act 1, Scene 3 of The Merchant of Venice, Shylock is an undocumented Mexican immigrant with a sort of shady predatory loan business. Um, and he threatens to cut out the tongue of Antonio, who is himself Mexican-American, but prejudiced against undocumented people. Drawing on Gloria Anzaldúa's meditations on the relationship between identity and language in her essay, How to Tame a Wild Tongue, the students transformed uh, Merchant's famous pound of flesh into una lengua, a tongue. Their video thus highlights the oppression faced by Spanish-speaking Mexican immigrants, particularly those who are undocumented, and it celebrates the vibrancy of borderlands languages, which are often derided as improper or impure because of the mixture of Spanish and English. 
Shylock's ability to translanguage or kind of switch between languages is emphasized throughout, as exemplified by his threat to Antonio, if I don't get my money within three months, te corto la lengua, I'll cut your tongue, right? Without his tongue, Shylock asserts, Antonio will never speak badly about our people again. So this appropriation of the Merchant of Venice, I think, really insists that Borderlands perspectives have a place in our classrooms, even in um, Shakespeare classrooms, and that the interpretive frameworks that they bring to the plays have a lot of potential to shape how we understand the plays themselves. And it has been cool to see um, scholars as well sort of pick up on some of the work that they've done. So I think, to me, one of the main um, pedagogical um, imperatives of this work is to really say that the knowledge y'all have as students, right, that you're bringing from a range of backgrounds is really central to our scholarship and to our performance and to our teaching and needs to really be invited into the classroom. And that's part of what we're really trying to do um, with the Colectiva. And so we're seeking to bring people in from a range of backgrounds and to build a range of reciprocal relationships. So we have there a number of our partners, right? Some of whom are kind of big deal humanities institutions like the Folger Shakespeare Library or the Mellon Foundation, but some of whom are also community arts organizations um, like the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center or Teatro Audaz, which are both in San Antonio and are doing this work around um, indigenous and um, borderlands arts in particular. And um, yes, yeah, so we're seeking to build that community of praxis and um, students, right, are also really important to that community. And kind of one of the scholarly kind of interventions we're making, but which is also pedagogical, is that we've been able to um, form a cohort of early career scholars who you can see up there. They're all really amazing. They're graduate students and, and a couple um, early um, post-graduate students who are doing work at various places at the intersections of Borderlands, um, you know, Shakespeare or Shakespeare and kind of Borderlands culture, some of whom are working more in Mexican studies or Mexican American studies. We've also been thrilled to collaborate with that local theater company, Teatro Audaz, to produce plays. I mean, I think another part of our intervention is to say that art creates knowledge as well. And as humanists, as we think about the humanities, we really need to think about what the artists are doing and what forms of knowledge are being conveyed um, through their work. And so uh, this is a really exciting play. Um, it's um, uh, again called IDJ, and it tells um, the story of a queer Chicano who lived through the AIDS epidemic as well as the Chicano civil rights movement. And so he sort of tells this virtuosic performance. He's also a DJ, so he's spinning records at the same time. And he's also performing in a play called Hamelot, which he describes as a gay one-man send-up of the immortal bard's most telling work. So he imagines Shakespeare as a kind of, or not Shakespeare, Hamlet as a kind of queer trans um, figure. Um, and so in short, he's really thinking about, especially, I mean, using the meditation on death that's throughout Hamlet to think about the AIDS crisis, um, and also more broadly to think about Hamlet's questions of identity in relation to his own identity as a queer Chicano, and thinking about how are those kind of similar, how are they different, like how can we think with these different texts um, and histories together. And so we've been working with the theater to produce this. We've also been working on um, lesson plans uh, with local high school teachers, um, as well as on a kind of oral history project where we're collecting the stories of the people who are involved in these performances um, and involved in writing these plays so that people who teach them or just read them will have more of a context to understand this like cultural framework. And so to close, um, I would love to welcome y'all into the Colectiva. It's, it's a collective, so y'all can, can join us. We're, um, we have a conference coming up. I know it's short notice and it's a long way, but on um, March 7th and 8th, we have a conference in San Antonio, um, but we'll be streaming some 
um, of the keynote talks and some round tape, some playwright roundtables. Um, Adit Villarreal, the author of The Language of Flowers, will be there. We'll be streaming her talk. She'll be in conversation with Jose Cruz Gonzalez. And we're really hoping um, that this conference will be a place where people are continuing to kind of produce this body of knowledge um, and where different, you know, all kinds of people from communities that are often kept somewhat separate, like academics and high school teachers and um, theater practitioners can kind of really come um, together. And finally, just a little plug, if you want to follow us all on social media, we're at um, Borderlands Shakes, S-H-A-X, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and with that, I want to thank you um, for um, your time and attention and being here today. And I would love to hear any questions or comments or feedback that y'all might have. So thank you. I would love to, and I actually should have mentioned that this student's uh, project was part of a national initiative called the Qualities of Mercy Project, which was led by a Shakespeare professor named Jonathan Burton. And so the idea was that people from a range of campuses, did y'all participate in it here? No, okay, so, so and maybe we'll do another, and y'all can be part of it, it'd be really cool. Um, but the idea was, that people uh, in, say, say you all were in Shakespeare class right now or whatever class where you're reading um, The Merchant of Venice, you would think about like, okay, well, how can we transform a scene in a way that reflects our local context in some way? So that's what my students came out, up with because they really wanted it to reflect San Antonio. And some of it's a little bit the touristy stuff like you saw at the beginning, the river walk and all that. But they also wanted to say like, yes, we wanted to reflect our Mexican American culture, but we want to show that Mexican-American culture is not just kind of a monolith, right? That there are different people, there are tensions within it. So they were really interested in the way that even some people who you know, were Mexican-American were still kind of um, prejudiced against undocumented people who were more recent immigrants. But yeah, there were really cool uh, performances. You can look them, look them up if you, on YouTube, Qualities of Mercy Project from all different places. Thank you for that question. Yes. Hello. Does this? Can I take this off? I should um, have. So in our humanities class, um, we just finished with the language of flowers, which was I loved it. But um, we're discussing the literary canon right now, and I just I'm curious on your opinion on this um, because we're talking about the literary canon and if works like that should be read in a company to like the traditional Romeo and Juliet, or if they should be replaced entirely. What's your stance on that? Such a good and hard question. I don't know. Um, I think it really depends. I, I, I guess part of what I want to say is I think we have the freedom to do what you want <laughs> to in some ways. It depends on the context. So I do, because I'm a Shakespeare professor, generally <laughs> teach, like, say, Romeo and Juliet and the language of flowers. I've experimented with teaching the language of flowers first, so as to not just sort of present it as derivative of Romeo and Juliet, but as a work more in its own right. And I do think it's important that we understand these ways not just as Shakespeare adaptations, but as part of a Chicano teatro tradition, which is one reason that I shared that information about teatro. Um, but my colleague, Adriana Santos, for example, like she teaches Mexican American studies. She teaches the language of flowers. She assumes students know a little about Romeo and Juliet, but she does not teach it because she's thinking about it more, again, within that context of teatro. So I guess I would want to encourage people to sort of just think that we have the freedom to do that. Like, I don't, I don't see this project as replacing Shakespeare. I feel like Shakespeare is doing okay. Like, <laughs> people are still teaching him. People are still reading him. Um, but I do think it's important to kind of call attention to these works. So I guess I'm trying to have it both ways, not both ways. Um, so in the language of flowers, there's like a scene where it's the priest who has these 
plants that he's taken from, like they're originally from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of like, he's explaining to this, fr like from Mexico, uh, woman who's with Julia and then playing what they do. And she is kind of, you know, she's, she's like, I, I'm from here. I know what they do. Right. These are my country's plants. Right. Like, so how does that kind of like, was that a very intentional, like, cultural appropriation kind of preference? Or was it, is it more just like in the tone of play? I think so. I mean, I think one thing that's really interesting, so a lot of these Romeo and Juliet character, or sorry, plays, do a lot with the figure of like the friar and also like the apothecary in terms of indigenous knowledges and things like that. And of course, as you know, in um, Romeo and Juliet, the um, friar is kind of associated with these herbs and the tradition that's like not quite Catholic. It's sort of uh, you know, outside of the, the bounds of his like, sanctioned religion. So, um, yes, there's a lot going on, I think, with a lot of these figures in terms of the treatment of religious, um, like healing, um, like herbs and things like that. So, for yeah, for those of you who haven't read the language of flowers, the, I forget, what's his name? In the language of flowers, anyway, the friar, whatever his name is, I should go back and look at that up. He is this, like, white dude who's kind of like a fellow traveler, like hippie guy who wants everyone to get along, right? But the place set in LA in the 90s and everyone's like not getting along. And so I think he really has, he has this like a great idea, right? He's like, you know, the great idea of warehouse from Romeo and Juliet, where it's like, I know, we'll pretend we'll almost kill her, right? And she'll like almost be dead, but she won't die. And so yeah, it's that, it's that like great moment. I do think I agree with your interpretation, which I think you're getting at. That, um, that it does seem to be an intentional kind of moment of calling attention to cultural appropriation because then the sort of nurse figure um, is just like, yeah, I get it, like I'm from Mexico. And also like kind of what are you doing <laughs> like, with, these, with these herbs? And so it is this great moment, I think, to say like, no, no. Like, and also she says, what are you, what are you doing trafficking them? Right? She calls attention to the fact that he's also illegally bringing the plants to the United States. And so I think there's a question especially about like what can cross the border, who can cross the border, and what can't. So he's for some reason this like white hippie dude who can bring like drugs across the border. You know what I mean? um, if, you, if you think about it that way. Um, whereas like Romeo was shot coming back across the border after he was like outside of the So so I do think I agree. I think they're definitely you should write a book. It's, it's especially interesting with too because like it's the nurse now take it is changed to take the role as the one that gives Julia the drugs. So as opposed to like prior to the original, mm -hmm. it's her taking kind of control of the plants that have been illegally taken to LA and she's taking back the culture of like from Mexico to use those for the purposes that she learned in Mexico. Yes, absolutely. Yes, you should totally write that paper. Um yes, I love that. <laughs> Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, she reclaims it, and I think importantly, how many of you have read this play? Has everyone read it as a like a plot explaining it to you? Since I haven't read it in a minute, I've sort of moved down to volume two in my brain. But um, yes, uh, I, I love that idea that she's reclaiming the, those herbs, right? And then also in that play, the death becomes a sort of entry into a Mexica indigenous afterlife, where she and the Romeo figure can be together. So the herbs, even though they kill her, well, but they lead to her death, right? Like, I guess it depends on how you think about it. But the point is, she's, whatever like, knowledge is being, indigenous knowledge is being reclaimed, like sort of through the plants, is also reclaimed in terms of the death, which is no longer a kind of tragic death or a Christian death, but a, like indigenous like, space where they can be reclaimed.
which would just further the narrative we're going to do anymore. So I just want to ask, like, in your opinion, does that like add like more layers onto the narrative of the original? Because like in the original, it's really just two rich families that mm -hmm. they're like rivals. But it's never really explained why they're rivals, but in the language of flowers, there's I feel like we're given the information that Julia's family is now more Americanized and like uh, Romeo's is just more like he, his family is like undocumented. And I just wanted to ask your opinion on that in the whole canon space of like narrative. Yeah, I think it's a great point. I, I think it does add layers, right? I mean, there's something, I, I, I mean, I guess it's kind of part of a point for Shakespeare, but we never know really why they're fighting or what the backstory is, like what happened. And there's bad stuff, right? There's a plague and, you know, there's a lot of kind of corruption, but we don't like kind of see what the problem is. Whereas I think in the language of flowers, yes, that like filled in. We understand what's causing some of the problem, the conflict, the poverty, the need for immigration, um, and all of that. So yeah, I definitely agree. And I think some of these plays are, are accounting, you know, works of criticism of faith, right? They're starting with problems about the original play and asking like, how can I like, answer this? Or in a different way, like fill in some of these gaps. So yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, worth everything just to see her. Um, so I'm wondering about the plays that you've got in your in the text. Um, sort of where do you find them? So a lot of them are unpublished scripts. I have two questions. So one is where do you find them and where are you looking for them? And sort of how are people coming to you? The other question is are any of these playwrights playing around with meter and rhythm? Yes. Um, yes. So the first question when we started thinking about this, we did not know of many plays at all. We started thinking about more like how to teach Shakespeare in culturally responsive ways in the Borderlands. And then we learned about a play that's in volume one, it's called Ophelio um, by Josh Innocencio, who's a Houston-based playwright, and it sort of reimagines, it's a short play, it reimagines the Ophelia character as a queer Latino who has experienced sexual assault. And so a lot of the flower imagery is really all that is like reimagined. And so we found that play and we're like, okay, that's cool. And then we heard about, you know, some other adaptations, but nothing that was really specific in the Mormons. But then we um, actually went to see the play The Tragic Body though. Um, and we were like, oh, there's this is like a trend. So we started doing some, you know, Googling, basically. And so we found some plays like Adithia and Alice play The Language of Flowers. It's from the 90s. It was first produced, it was called R and J and produced in 1991. And so that play's been around for a while. It came out of this need to um, really to find roles for her students. Because a lot of the students, they to be actors, they you know needed to be Shakespeare, that they were like tired of sort of these like white roles that they were not getting cast in, you know, outside of the university in general. And so she and actually Jose Cruz Gonzalez, who's a, again he wrote the Wichita adaptation that we have in the anthology, they collaborated initially on the idea of um, the language of flowers. So it's a lot of university theaters and also community theaters are the main spaces. I do think that it's become enough of a trend though, so the Comedia of Errors play that we have in here was performed by the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, for example, and it was part of their, um, well, they do a whole thing where they tour and do um, like plays in the community, so it was part of that. Now, luckily, people do come to us, so it's exciting when people are like, oh, have you heard about this? You know, people tell us. But we definitely had to do some deep digging mostly for little digging, <laughs> but also do theater reviews as well, to, you know, to find some of the plays. And then meter, yes, some of them are. So um, a play um, called Measure por Medida, which is a measure for measure adaptation um, by Bernardo Lassandayer, he really has this idea, it's, it was hard, really hard. He wanted to do a bilingual, fully bilingual measure, but he wanted to really keep the meter even in the Spanish, you know, as much as he could, even in the Spanish, and he wanted to keep the, even though he went to his border Spanish, he wanted to make sure that the poetry was like sort of elevated at the like register, you know, Shakespeare, that it wasn't seen as just sort of lower class, like, I mean, there were scenes of lower class characters, but when it's like the main character speaking. So he really was trying to think about meter. Uh, this is more of a 
great, in quotes, translation. It's not fun, but it's definitely using like quarter savage and thinking about there. So yeah, you'll see some of the plays are more concerned with that than, than others. And I'll say that the company mirrors as well. Um, so this is more of a general question about Shakespeare. I was really struck uh, hearing that the Tempest was banned in Arizona, and you know, based on its like themes that it provides around different identity exploration. Um, last semester we read Othello in my Mary's class, and I was struck how like he has like, so many like. <laughs> Themes of like racial identity and otherness in like such an early work. Do you think that along like, with your work, do you think that Shakespeare intended to like leave these open to leave these themes to be explored like more broadly? That's a great question. And I think that Shakespeare adapted, stole <laughs> right from so many sources. Um, and then these themes, I think we often have this impression that issues like race or colonialism are really new and they, well, people started talking about them recently. But I've been working, I mean, my sort of other book project is more about you know, some of the stuff that's happening in like the Roman Empire, which like, by the way, like, did colonialism, right? Like, so I was like thinking about, had, had a way of thinking about race as well. Not the same way that we think about race, but different ways. Um, and so I do think because Shakespeare is like taking from all these different like, sources, and he's rethink and he's dealing with his own time period, right? And England's not, you know, really involved. They're starting a little bit to become involved in the transatlantic slave trade at that time, but but not in a full fledged way. But they're kind of thinking about it. They're looking at what Spain is doing in the Americas. So I guess I just think that Shakespeare's really dealing with all of these forces that continue to shape our world, and that really did shape modernity if you think about it that way. So I don't know what he intended, but I definitely think his practice leaves space right, for those kind of adaptations. Yeah, that's such good questions. <laughs> Production. It's the, the space they were really trying to depict the South Side. And so the South Side is a Mexican American like, part of the city. It's sort of underserved. It's, um, but there's a lot of really flourishing you know, art and culture happening there. Um, so, and the institution is probably at least 85 or so percent Latinx. And so, part of I think what I experienced when I sort of moved there was like, one, like, like, well, what am I doing? Like, why am I teaching Shakespeare in this context? Like, this is kind of cool. <laughs> like, what, what, what are we doing here? Um, and also, like, I felt like I had a lot to learn, right? And so I learned, learned a lot from my students and from my colleagues. Um, but I also really got just interested from a more intellectual way, like, in the art and culture that was being produced. And then I started working with my collaborator, Adriana, who's also at my institution as well. We started doing some of that, you know, work together. So I think part of it was from just a desire to do more culturally sustaining work for my students because I think you could see students, especially like frankly, when they had like white humanities professors who were just sort of saying like here's the tradition you all need to learn, the tradition that you have like come from, you know, in your homes, etc. It doesn't like matter that much and I'm certainly not gonna learn it. Like it's just sort of a jarring, right, and kind of violent experience for some students. So I saw students experiencing that, and I was kind of like, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I want to, you know, I don't want to do it perfectly, and I don't, right? I was like, I need to at least, you know, like, have some, like, passable Spanish and be able to, like, think about ways of bringing in Mexican-American tags in particular, um, you know, to the, to the classroom, even when I do some like teaching, you know, or, or British literature. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is awesome. Okay. Um, 
Well, I'm just going to be, uh, he talked about Gloria and Zaldúa earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, so she talks about how, as well as being a, a Chicano, more about uh, her experiences as a Chicano woman and as a queer woman, so I was wondering, is that perspective in your uh, Shakespeare Collectivo works, how do you incorporate that modern perspective? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we do work to, um, in that legacy way, to support queer border cultural production. Um, and so I think, yes, it definitely is. Um, not all of the plays deal with it, like, explicitly, but there are some that do. I mean, so one way is um, IDJ, the play that we helped to kind of get produced in San Antonio, is like a very like, queer work and is very important to the queer scene in San Antonio particularly. And so again, given some of the kind of political dynamics in Texas, Right now, I think people were happy that we like, supported it, like in a kind of fun, we like, helped fund it with our Melon Grant, basically. But, but uh, we were trying to like put up anywhere our mouths are in that, in that way, you know? And then that play, um, Ophelio uh, by Josh and Asensio, also was thinking about queerness, particularly thinking about Shakespeare's ideas of gender. There seems to be an interesting way in which some of these playwrights are thinking through what does it mean? Like, okay, like both of those plays are actually Hamlet adaptations. And you see different people in the borderlands thinking about how this kind of to be or not to be framing in a slightly different way. So it's not just like to be alive or not to be alive, but it's like what does it mean to like be Mexican but also American? What does it mean to sort of like you know be queer in this border space? Like what does you know, especially in a space where there are you know forces that are threatening that identity, and so then there is a kind of like violent surveillance, militarized, like police space. So a lot of people, I think, are using Hamlet, I would say it specifically, is the play where people are trying to be like, using to think about queer uh, issues. Although I'm sure, we, like one of the brilliant things about this is we keep seeing more and more um, of these adaptations pop up. So if anyone wants to write some more queer Shakespeare adaptation or trans Shakespeare adaptation or you know, anything, I think there literally is like space for it. So thanks, I think we're about, it sounds like we're about out of time, but I'm happy to chat with anybody if you have, you know, have time after. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Kate. It was fabulous. A really interesting work and I know an inspiration to a lot of our students. Um, so that's it for the lecture, but uh, at 3 o'clock, we would like to see a lot of you guys back here cycling through, getting your dessert, to talk to some of our alumni who are here, our fabulous alumni who are here for Alumni Table Talks. Uh, there'll be bios. Uh, we did send some of those out, uh, but there'll be a stack of bios. So you can see the kind of people that are here, and you can chat with them about all kinds of things. We've got at least two lawyers. We've got people from education. We've got people from public health. We've got all kinds of amazing folks. So please come back and we will see you. Thanks again to everybody else who came to make the O'Day Lecture Series an annual festival and treat. <laughs>